Uh, now I get to say some nice things about Ben Strauss. Uh, ben is both CEO and chief scientist. So I really resonate with Ben because there aren't that many people who are scientists and CEOs of organizations. And uh, even in the environmental world, it's, it's less common. Um, and so Ben is uh, CEO and chief scientist of, of, of there it says, Climate Central. Um, Climate Central is a really unusual organization. And I would say if it didn't exist, we'd have to make it up because it really looks at communicating science, right? And communication of science has a leverage and an impact that far exceeds anything else we can do with our scientific education. Uh, ben and I have parallel, although he is much younger than I am, uh, academic careers having undergrad at Yale and master's and PhD at Princeton. We were in the same department at Princeton, but he took the road less traveled. And he took the risk uh, of going off and doing something different. Um, and uh, I will quote one of our scientists, Stuart Pickett, who recently wrote a think piece about how we have to get past this alternative careers idea. This is not an alternative career. This is an amazing career. And so Ben has had huge impact and has been able to leverage knowledge to communities that don't really want to hear the words climate and science in the same sentence, right? So it is a real thrill. And I know Ned is very pleased because I always check with him, but uh, I am thrilled to have uh, Ben here. And Ben, the floor is yours and thank you for coming up from Princeton. Thank you, Ned. Uh, thank you so much, Josh. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. And uh, thanks to um, all of the staff, uh, Lori, Mary Beth, I've been telling everyone this is the most organized organization that I've interacted with relative to any talk or thing I've done. Um, so terrific to be here. Um, and thanks for having me. Um, I'll also say that it's really nice to be back at an ecological institute because it connects to my scientific roots although I then took a, a turn not only into communication, but into a focus on sea level rise and its impact. So um, I advertised that this talk would pivot off of a kind of eureka moment or insight in, in, the, in the blurb. And um, those are really special and few in a lifetime, I think. Um, so before I get to that point in the story, I need to share a little bit of background uh, about myself and where I was coming from. So um, my father, who's in the audience tonight, um, got me this photograph um, about 10 years after it was taken, uh, signed by the photographer who was up there orbiting the moon. Uh, they, they were colleagues um, for a couple of years at a job in DC. And, um, at the time, I really didn't understand its significance at all, but I just thought it was pretty cool. Um, and it hung in my room uh, and watched over me as I slowly developed into a young environmentalist. Um, over those early years, elementary, junior, high school, I developed two, I think, very formative ideas. One, I remember walking back from Hebrew school and really struggling with the idea of, well, wanting to have a path where I felt that what I did in the world was right or righteous or good, but um, having a hard time developing a sense of confidence of what that path could be, because I learned over time that, you know, what might be good and uh, believed to be good in one place and time could be condemned in another place and time. Uh, and I, I, I thought one of my big values was tolerance, but what if, if, if tolerance is your value, do you tolerate those who are intolerant? And I, I was tying myself into knots um, around, you know, how, how to maybe assure myself that I, I could have full confidence um, in whatever path I, I was going to choose. And at the same time, I had a great interest in theater. I acted in a lot of plays and musicals. and um, I developed this metaphor in my head, which is that the struggle for just uh, for justice, the struggle for a good life, uh, right, is it's it's an eternal part of human existence, and it's part of what gives us 
meaning, and it's hard to know what the right lines are. I didn't know. I didn't have a great deal of confidence, but I realized there was one thing I really felt confident about, which was that we can't burn down the theater. We need to keep the theater. And so that idea really cemented me in the direction of environmentalism. In college, um, I encountered um, a, a short story describing a talk that David Brower used to give. And then I saw it, uh, his sermon, uh, in which he kind of describes the whole history of life on Earth as taking the six days of creation. And of course, it takes a couple days for life to get going. And you don't get the dinosaurs till the last day. Um, you know, plants in the morning, dinosaurs in the afternoon, I forget exactly what. Uh, and, and humans come along a couple minutes before midnight, and maybe Jesus was a second before midnight, and one fortieth of a second was the Industrial Revolution. Uh, a, a one fortieth of a second before midnight, and Brower would end his talk saying, you know, we're surrounded by people who think that we can keep on doing indefinitely what we have been doing for that one fortieth of a second. And they're considered normal, but they're stark raving mad. And that image also really stuck with me. And I, I would think of this picture and, and imagine the kind of time lapse sequence of the surface of the earth and how rapidly it has kind of shockingly changed in the last few centuries. So I became um, fairly uh, desperate to share these feelings and insights and kind of normal life became painful in a lot of ways. Things people around me cared about seemed small. Um, that was my state and I went to graduate school uh, as Josh described um, in ecology and evolution. Uh, and it looked kind of like this. Uh, that's me. Uh, I, you know, for a time I studied butterflies, then bees, and then I wound up with snails because I was faster than them. And uh, snails and stream bottoms, that's a homemade clear bottom bucket. Uh, I spent a lot of time in the Southern Appalachian Mountains like that. Um, took nine years in the end to get my PhD. It was a lot of fun. It took a long time. And it also, to me, but I wasn't getting where I wanted to go. Um, I did also take some, I took my time and part of what I did was I, I helped to, um, I was a founding board member of a couple different nonprofits, one called the Environmental Leadership Program and the other called GRIST, which I just heard today. You'll, you'll now hear every week on Here and Now on NPR. Um, so that's, that's, they've been making great progress. Um, and at the end of my graduate career, I just had a great stroke of luck, which was that at the very time I had my last committee meeting, one of my graduate committee members was starting a new climate communication organization in a few months. And he said, Ben, do you have a few minutes to talk? Uh, what are you doing next? And I ended up being one of the first four to walk in the door at Climate Central, um, where our, our mission, the initial idea was really to purely be a, a kind of bridging institution from science to the American public, climate science. Um, we didn't plan to do research. It was just going to be synthesis and translation. Um, just like I never planned to get into sea level rise. I'm a mountain person, honestly, uh, interested in wilderness and biodiversity. Um, but the logic of our work eventually led us to say, we do need to do some research, even though our mission is communication, because there are some very important pieces of research that are missing um, that could help us communicate much more powerfully. Um, and similarly, in my choice of sea level rise, it was a strategic choice because um, to communicate effectively, I understood, you know, sea level rise is very visual. We're a visual species. Uh, Probably most importantly, it's very local. It's the most localizable of all climate impacts. Um, very tangible, simple mental model. So I ended up the kind of mountain wilderness guy focusing on sea level rise in low, flat, highly densely populated areas because 
people would pay attention if we talked about how many people might be affected uh, by rising seas. And within a few years, um, found some real success. Published um, a couple papers together in 2012 in March um, with some on the, really the first popular online interactive maps where you could look up you know, your house and where was the water coming. And I, I knew the New York Times might cover it or was going to cover it um, and possibly prominently. So I, I was living on the Upper West Side at the time and on the morning that it came out, this was back in the age when we all still mainly read the newspaper in print. Um, I, I got up really early for me, 6.30, walked down the hall uh, to pick up our paper. And, you know, there it was on the front page. It was, it was a day that really, and, and above the fold, um, it was a day that changed my life. Uh, there was a lot of, I was on the, network news that evening, uh, testifying in the Senate a month later. Um, then Sandy came a few months after that, and Anderson Cooper had me up on the roof of the Time Warner building to talk about it. Um, and so in one sense, I was suddenly having an impact that was a dream for me. But on the other, on the other hand, carbon dioxide was still increasing in the atmosphere faster than the year before and faster than the year before that. Um, and um, the Paris talks, the big climate talks in Paris in 2015 were coming up, and I really wanted to shift from just U.S. to global focus to be part of that conversation because it was setting up to be a key moment. Um, and I came across, so this is a piece of public art uh, that was put out in Paris uh, in December of 2015 during the meetings. Uh, I, I was there and saw it, but it actually relates to a piece of science that I found a couple years before and that formed the basis of a whole analysis we did in a series of maps and imagery that we developed. Um, these are all chunks of ice that calved off of Greenland and the um, Danish Greenland uh, artist Olafur, or I, I, I think Danish Icelandic artist, excuse me, Olafur Eliasson took a boat out there lassoed these, tugged them to Copenhagen, loaded them on trucks, and uh, uh, trucked them to Paris, and laid them out in the 12 positions of a clock, and called it Ice Watch. And during the talks, the ice was slowly melting. So it's a brilliant metaphor, time, kind of watching the ice, watching it melt. And I think, but scientifically, um, there's a really simple but very important idea here, which is that if you put a big chunk of ice somewhere that's warm enough to melt it, it doesn't vaporize in an instant. It takes time. And in just the same way, as we turn the thermostat up on the planet's temperature, it's taking time for the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets to respond and the glaciers. So there's a lot more sea level rise in the pipeline than we see today, a great deal more. Uh, and we call this sea level rise commitment or a lock-in. So, um, and, and I think people probably without thinking about it tend to assume if we stopped polluting the atmosphere, right? It, problems would stop, right? Or if it ever gets that bad, we'll just stop. But in fact, we'll just stop making things worse but we've got a tremendous amount of momentum and continuation. Um, but we realized that this idea could be used to bring kind of far future consequences into the present tense, because that's another big problem of climate communication. You're talking about things in the far future, people tune out, but now we could talk about, hey, what are we locking in right now, this, this decade? this next decade kind of bring those because the truth is that the bigger difference the bigger visual difference the, the bigger impact difference between a high pollution path and a low pollution path right happens farther in the future how do we make that more immediate in the present so we used uh, scientific projections of sea level rise that would take multiple centuries to play out but which would be locked in by different amounts of warming that might be agreed upon in Paris. 
So for instance, this is an image of the sea level at a, a familiar landmark uh, if we were to get to four degrees Celsius. Not the day we got to four degrees in the centuries to follow, but um, you know, you can take a moment and anyone just in your own mind, see if you recognize what that is, where it is. And now I'll reveal the two degrees Celsius uh, version, which is right there. Um, then we have a um, four degree Celsius version of the gateway to India and in Mumbai um, and a two degree version. So we um, went, we, we published a scientific paper and report and maps and all of this imagery. We managed to get it in a few weeks before the Paris meetings um, began. It was, that became uh, the biggest kind of uh, media coverage success that we had had as an organization. It ran in the Borneo Post. And when you run in the Borneo Post, you know that you've really made it internationally. Um, there were about five, by the end, uh, we hired a firm to count and it, there was more than 5,000 mentions and stories around the world. Um, so that was our attempt to kind of show the poster, hey, delegates, you know, which world do you want? Poster A or poster B? And by the time I got to Paris, I really felt like, you know, the expert on the sea level rise threat. Um, but then I walked under that door, um, under the kind of sea monster at the Institut Océanographique de Paris. And uh, I just went one night, there were all these side events going on. Um, and uh, this one was the premiere of a David Attenborough documentary. Uh, and he was a huge hero of mine. I'd grown up watching his documentaries. He was going to be in there in person. I had to meet him. You know, I got about two words in before he was whisked away. But, but um, the documentary was about the Great Barrier Reef, and it was amazing because it, it, this was the moment for me. It told the story about the formation of the reef. 20,000 years ago, it was the coldest point of the last ice age. And the global sea levels were 400 feet lower than they are today. Um, and then naturally the planet warmed. And between around 15,000 years ago and 6,000 years ago, we got those 400 feet of sea level rise. And they're talking about how, you know, the water, what is beneath the Great Barrier Reef used to be a coastal plain. You know, the water came up and drowned it. And then the, the, the corals grew up on top of that plain and kept on following the water. And that's how the reef developed. And you can radiocarbon date bits of coral at the base of the reef in different places to kind of figure out when the water first got there. And so we know that the water was flooding across the plain around 14,000 years ago um, and then continued for many thousands of years. Um, but that wasn't the thing that got me. I knew that history roughly. Then the documentary cut to a story um, told by a local Aboriginal group near Cairns uh, in Queensland of the Gimoy Walubara Yidinji people. And um, they told the story of Gunya. Gunya was an ancestor who hunted the forbidden fish, the sacred fish. And when he struck it with his spear, the fish became very angry and punished his people by raising the ocean. And the people said, at that time we were living out by the cliffs. And from the scans in the science part of the documentary, those cliffs first got underwater around 14,000 years ago. So here was a story which in the final analysis is between 10,000 and 14,000 years old. This people remember those cliffs they remember losing their home. They didn't have written language until the English arrived a couple hundred years ago. And, but for hundreds and hundreds of generations, this was traumatic enough that they kept that story. And I 
suddenly realized that this was a warning. <laughs> and then I didn't know the first thing about the pain, the trauma, the mark that losing your home to the ocean could leave. Um, and I, I went home and I Googled world's oldest story. And you know you, the answer you still get is Gilgamesh, which was written down 4,000 years ago. I mean, it's an infant story compared to, to Gunya. So I just became fascinated. I understood that the ocean rose around the world, not just in Australia, there, you know, where there are other stories. Um, is there a warning, a message, a wisdom in these stories that we can connect to and learn from? So I slowly started a quest in parallel to my regular kind of scientific career to look into these ancient stories. Um, starting with the very obvious place, uh, maybe one of the very best known stories in the most read book in the world, um, Noah's Flood. And why Noah's Flood? Would they, could they really be similar? You probably think of that as a rain event. The story says 40 days and nights of rain. But if you look at the actual text, when the flood first happens, here is the actual text in a direct translation from the Hebrew, all the fountains of the great deep burst apart and the floodgates of the sky broke open. So the text, it's an ocean flood and a rain flood. And the great deep can also be translated as cosmic waters of the ocean depths. Um, there actually have been theories that Noah's, different theories have explained Noah's flood and we'll never know for sure. One, it's a river flood uh, in Mesopotamia. Uh, a lot of people were there, the river flooded a lot. Of course, it would flood and then recede, right? The flood would recede and that was a fairly routine event, but there could have been a terrible flood. Uh, a couple of scientists at Columbia thought maybe um, as the world ocean was rising, uh, the Mediterranean overtopped the Bosporus Sill and flooded um, the Black Lake, turning it into the Black Sea, and it could have risen by 40 feet in a matter of weeks. Maybe that was it. That has subsequently been pretty much disproven that at the time that would have happened, the level of the Black Lake was actually just as high um, as the Mediterranean. Um, so I um, started my own investigation just poking around. Um, this is um, the first of a number of illustrations I will share from the book I'm working on. Um, I'm working with an artist uh, because we, in, instead of most of the maps I've been involved in making have been digital, but we wanted to touch the imagination more uh, for the book. You can probably guess where this is. Um, it's how the Arabian Peninsula and lower Mesopotamia used to look about 20,000 years ago. And the next map is the reveal showing kind of the current context. And you can see that uh, the whole Persian Gulf used to be a, a river floodplain. Um, and so the ocean crept up that river uh, and filled in that area over time. Um, and I, I'd like to imagine um, someone living along the river whose grandfather had known the ocean as a, a five-day walk, and whose father had known it as a three-day walk, and who, when at his birth, it was a one-day walk, and watched it getting closer to closer. And if, if you had a lot of stuff, if you were wealthy and maybe a bit eccentric, I could even imagine building an ark to hold it so that when the water came, you could float away. A little more seriously, um, a, a, a more detailed analysis that I won't share here um, finds a depression in the Persian Gulf that would have been isolated. And during a, a 500 year period between 14,000 and 15,000 years ago, called Meltwater Pulse 1A, when uh, sea level rose particularly quickly, the ocean would have reached that basin and it could have filled a 50 mile by 20 mile area up in a matter of days or weeks. Um, also, it's easy to imagine a hybrid event, just like the Bible says. The river 
level would have been going up and up as the ocean rose. And then imagine a 500 year flood of the river kind of destroying natural or artificial levees and meeting the ocean that was marching in so that the place that was flooded uh, never recovered. That would place uh, Noah's flood about 10,000 years earlier than any actual event that is known to map to the depictions in the, in the Bible. But if Aboriginal people could remember for 10 or 14,000 years, why couldn't the Mesopotamians before they wrote it down? So um, I'll also note that um, Noah's flood is the worst punishment in the Bible. And like Good News Story, right? People did something wrong, the gods punished us and we've got to behave better. So that's an important little theme. Now after, and it was the worst punishment. So after the flood and Noah finds land, God shows a rainbow, it makes one of the very few covenants in the Bible uh, saying that God will never again destroy the earth by a flood. But there's a loophole that I call the rainbow loophole, which is God never said that we wouldn't destroy ourselves with a flood. And unfortunately, we seem to be walking right through that loophole, loophole um, with climate change and sea level rise. So um, looking forward now with the maps, uh, here's a map looking forward. Uh, this is a projection for a hundred years into the future with you know, limiting things to 2C warming, mid range, this, this is a very middle of the road projection. You can try and guess where this is. Uh, and I'll reveal on the next map, you know, the dark is water, the light is land. Um, that's Southern Louisiana. And the, the, the chunky part on the right is, is I, actually I'm giving credit, I assume that the levees hold. So there's a lot of land that's lower than the ocean, but shown in white. Um, here's another place that you couldn't possibly guess, but um, th this is part of the Marshall Islands, uh, the capital, uh, the main set of atolls, which I'm showing because the president of the Marshall Islands was really one of the, probably the, the most important negotiator in Paris uh, that helped get to a strong ambition. Here's a place that'll be a little more familiar. This is farther into the future. This is a two degrees Celsius warming scenario, multi-century. Um, and here's, here's the reveal on how we look today. Um, here's another two degrees Celsius map um, uh, and with the present context. Um, uh, now, uh, you know, fun and distressing, but 10,000 years in the future. This image I, I think of as the Grinch uh, from Dr. Seuss, but it could be the future shape of San Francisco. Uh, this is 10,000 years of sea level rise if we basically burn half of the fossil fuel on the ground and leave the other half in, which I think we're going to do a good deal better than that, by the way. But this is just for illustration. Um, here's another uh, same 10,000 year scenario. Um, San Francisco has a lot of hills compared to the southeast. Um, but now, um, going back to the past again, here's a map of Australia 20,000 years ago. It's actually not just Gunya's story. Um, a wonderful scholar named Patrick Nunn has uncovered more than 30 Aboriginal stories from all around Australia um, that remember. And uh, here, so Gunya was, lived near Cairns, uh, and note this other site, the Gwion Bradshaw rock art site. Uh, there was a lot of land to be lost there. And um, what's at that site is a whole series of rock paintings, uh, very mysterious. Um, no one knows who made them or when they were made. Uh, this is one of them. But a, a few years ago, finally, scientists dated it by using the fact that there were, there were wasps that live in the area that uh, make nests out of mud and sometimes like flecks of charcoal in the mud from a, a forest fire were, were datable and they found pieces of painting that were kind of above 
some um, mud residue and below some mud residue, and they were able to date these paintings very precisely to a, a, maybe a 200 year period, about 12,000 years ago, which was a time of a dramatic retreat of the land and the advance of the ocean. And to me, I found this very haunting because that picture sure looks like a human conflict uh, to me. And uh, it's one of the things we worry uh, the most about today with sea level rise is if you displace people, one thing is to displace and lose home, but the other is migration into conflict with other people in other places, right? And maybe this is an echo of the same thing happening 12,000 years ago. Um, moving west, uh, here is India about 20,000 years ago. You can take a look uh, at how it's changed. So a lot of loss, especially in the Northwest, uh, also the South. Um, and in India, there are a great deal of stories that explicitly talk about the rising ocean and different ages. Uh, maybe the, the most important one is, um, uh, or well-known at least in Hindu mythology, uh, there was a flood that consumed the place where Manu lived. And Manu was the first man. In fact, Manu is the etymological origin for the term man. Um, and, you know, there was a fish involved here too. In this case, Manu, you know, was the only one who respected the fish and protected the fish. And then the fish warned him of the flood and came to rescue him uh, when the flood came. Um, and the Indian stories, quite interestingly, do talk about multiple pulses, multiple waves of sea level rise and retreat, which correspond roughly to the scientific understanding of multiple meltwater pulses when sea level rise uh, happened more quickly. And in the, in the Indian oral and epic um, poetry tradition, right, these eras were separated by thousands of years. And I think a lot of these stories have been dismissed by Western scientists as, as pure fantasy, but in fact, they turn out to be telling, uh, you know, to remembering uh, many happenings many thousands of years ago. Um, most dramatically, there was a whole subcontinent that existed 20,000 years ago called Sundaland. Um, today it's Southeast Asia and Indonesia. Uh, the area that drowned is about the size of India um, today. And um, there are far, I mean, th and this is the epicenter of flood stories, far too much to get into, but crabs and birds and snakes and boats and brothers and sisters, um, tons of stories throughout Southeast Asia and especially Indonesia and the Philippines. Now this man has a connection to Sundaland. Uh, his name is Anote Tong. Um, he was the president of Kiribati, a Pacific Atoll nation. Um, I met him about 10 years ago at a special weekend retreat to talk about sea level rise. Um, and as you might imagine, his home uh, is in very much danger today. Um, here's a recent photograph of a high tide in, in part of Kiribati. Uh, here's another one. And uh, this, was, this was a small retreat at a kind of exclusive spot. And, and we all had cabins with little campfire rings near them. And I was walking home uh, one evening home to my cabin and President Tong was sitting at the campfire with one other person and he said, come here. Uh, and we talked a bit and he looked me in the eye and he said, Ben, how long do we have? How long do we have? He, he was the first person, the first leader of a Pacific Island nation to say, we recognize that we're going to have to move and we don't want to be climate refugees. We are going to move with dignity. But he told me, you know, no scientist will ever tell me, like, do I have 10 years? Do I have 50 years? Do I have 100? And I couldn't answer either. Um, understanding how quickly sea level will rise is a much harder problem than how much actually, right? If we had a truckload of ice in the middle of this room, we'd all know it's gonna melt. <laughs> 
much harder to say how many you know liters per hour and exactly when it would finish but that was another moment for me right where there was such a depth of feeling this was not an abstract map it wasn't even a colorful image um it was really it, it gave me a new understanding of the work that we were doing um but you might be wondering you know what does this have to do with sundaland what it has to do with Sundaland is that when Sundaland drowned, some people stayed in the Indonesian islands. Um, many moved, fled west as far as India and in fact, Mesopotamia and Sumer. And some went east. And a lot of the ones who went east ended up in Taiwan. And Taiwan, a couple thousand years later, became the jumping off point to settle Polynesia. And so this is pure speculation on my part, but imagine, imagine living on a subcontinent that slowly was drowning. And so you watched a place that used to be connected become an island, and then a smaller island. Your land became an island, and it started to get smaller. The places you used to go to hunt or get fruit or trade got more and more water between you and those places. I can't think of a more powerful set of circumstances to develop an ocean going, a sea going culture, uh, expertise in boats and navigation. And so my speculation is that perhaps this was the seeds of the um, Polynesians unrivaled marine abilities, right? They colonized these specks in the massive Pacific thousands of years ago. Maybe the origins were within the stresses of Sundaland. Um, and thinking back to President Tong, he wouldn't have realized it consciously, and neither did I, but his people are threatened potentially with losing their home to the ocean for a second time. Um, here's another image I like. Uh, this is looking into the past. To me, it's either Snuffleupagus. Um, or a horse, um, but it's actually how Europe used to look. You could walk from Scandinavia uh, to the UK once upon a time, and that big area filled in in the North Sea was called Doggerland, and it was probably the number two largest area that drowned, and it dissolved into islands and then disappeared. And I couldn't help but make the connection that the culture that eventually was able to first cross the Atlantic Ocean comes from exactly that part of the world. Maybe the same sorts of forces helped to encourage maritime culture there. So um, one of the silver linings of COVID uh, for me right, was going, going online and reconnecting with some people who were distant um, one of them was my childhood rabbi. And uh, two years ago, he asked if I would give a talk to you know, one of his adult education discussion groups about this work. Um, and so doing my homework, I decided to read past, you know, when I thought of Noah's flood, I, I you know, read the two pages about Noah's flood. I decided to read a little more. Um, and the very next story, is Babel, right? People build the tower, it's too high. God punishes by scattering, scattering us and giving people different languages. And a light bulb went off for me because looking at the uh, indigenous stories from around the world, a very common theme, not universal, but quite common is the flood came and then we scattered. Now, there's no reference to flood in Babel, but it comes right after Noah's flood, right? So flood and then scatter. And in fact, there's some passages in between that say, right, after the flood, we went and scattered. Um, I also found a modern climate change allegory because the tower was the first construction in the Bible. It's made with bricks that were fired, that were put together with bitumen, which is a fossil substance. 
and then it reaches too high where into the sky right so this is industry somehow impinging on the sky it couldn't have been i mean it's just an uncanny coincidence um and ironic too that that story would follow immediately after the rainbow loophole right within a page um unfortunately our modern babble um, makes it extra hard, right, to tackle a global problem, uh, let alone in the US, right? We're, we're condemned to try and negotiate to, to somehow cooperate to take care of our common atmosphere across 200 countries and all of their languages, let alone the political and cultural differences we have within this country and some others. So uh, a, a rather difficult punishment, I'd say. Um, finally, um, and most speculatively, uh, there's Adam and Eve and Eden, right? No flood reference, but what's the punishment? To be permanently expelled from home. You can't return to paradise. Um, and the Bible, Genesis, was written after a 10,000 year long period during which the ocean was rising and constantly displacing people from their homes. Because even today we live disproportionately near the ocean and in low places, and it would have been far more so in the past, right? Because we lacked all of the convenient modes of transport we have today. Um, there's also this little tantalizing bit um, from Sundaland. Refugees went east um, to Taiwan and to Polynesia, and then they went west as far as Mesopotamia, which is where right the, where the Bible got written, where Genesis is set. Um, the Polynesian word for woman is Evie. <laughs> so think of that. So my life and work has been the struggle to raise attention to the climate problem. Um, we're gaining, we're making some progress uh, with the IRA and other measures, but not nearly enough. Um, but in doing all of this research, a kind of, and, and I, I guess what I really want to say is that we're also gaining a, a public understanding and awareness is improving in this country and in the world. Um, but as I did this research, a pretty shocking to me question slowly arose, which is maybe climate change and sea level rise aren't really side issues as most of society treats them today. Maybe these are things which are actually core to the arc of all of human history. I mean, at least the last 15,000 years, right? Two thirds of that time was continually traumatized and re-traumatized by the advance of the ocean. And it figures into stories that form, as best as I can see, our most widely shared and oldest common cultural heritage around the whole world. It's deeply rooted also in Hinduism through Manu and in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam through Noah's flood uh, and Genesis, the old part of Genesis. And I think this is something that has been completely missed uh, by modern scholars and historians, this kind of formative you know, period where climate change and its consequences were at the core of the human experience. Fortunately to me, I think climate is the easiest hard problem we have. We actually, unlike you know, justice or conflict, or hunger or disease, we know the solutions. They look like this. And protecting forests, 
and doing this and all of these other things. There's almost no area that's not connected. So it's easier, we know what to do, but it's still a hard problem. And the critical point is that to do all of these things, and we need to do them all, and eventually to agree to pay for the huge cost of sucking carbon back out of the atmosphere for no economic benefit to anyone except the global commons, um, we're going to need all hands on deck, deeply committed for decades. That's my basic premise. And how do you do that? We need a culture shift. And I think that stories will be a key ingredient. Our ancestors responded to their crises with stories. And their stories were powerful. They've lasted for thousands and thousands of years, hundreds of generations. They helped to shape who we are. It's a widespread Aboriginal value to treat other life forms with great respect, like Gunya should have treated the sacred fish. Right? Noah is a formative moral story in the Judeo-Christian tradition. Don't be wicked but rather be righteous and walk with God. Don't be corrupt or violent. Of course, no matter what they did, our ancestors could not have stopped the floods. They were rising. The water was rising naturally. But this time, the cause is us. And we do, therefore, have the power to slow them down. The moral weight of the old stories now rightly falls on our shoulders and more so than it ever fell on the shoulders of our ancestors. And I think we're gonna need the power of stories to do the job, uh, to help inspire and sustain the major effort that's required. So can we listen? This message is so important that it has crossed hundreds of generations and cultures all around the world. Can we develop new stories that people will hear today? Our individual carbon footprints matter, of course, but only what we do together can really turn the ship. So to me, talking, communicating are critical solutions. It's a force multiplier strategy. That's my work. My organization's work, it can be your work, it can be anyone's work. Climate change makes up about half of 1% of the news today in repeated analyses. Repeat surveys indicate that most people rarely discuss it. We have to change that. If we all tell enough stories well enough, I believe we can do something much bigger than the path that we're on. More change is coming. How much is up to us? In the end, there's no escape rocket ship. This planet is our only home. Can we make it our ark? And what stories will our descendants tell about us? Thank you. We have time for a few questions. Uh, I will repeat the questions so people who are here virtually can hear them. Go back. Well, so how, how does this information get into educational systems in the United States? Is the question. Um, two answers. Um, kind of broadly, the work we do at Climate Central. We make a lot of imagery and maps, and we know that there's a tremendous amount of use in the educational community, um, people who are downloading and using. Although, to be honest, we haven't yet made a concerted effort to connect. The other thing I'll say is I'm working on a book of this. So 
Um, this, what I've shared tonight is, is a special, <laughs> it's a side project. <laughs> it's not my day job, um, but I've come to feel it's profoundly important because it, it, it touches, um, I think, hearts and soul, you know, it, it just connects to a human element in a different way than the data and the simple images do. So um, writing a book for a, a wide public audience. Right, you can sit down, it's okay. Dr. Cross, uh, we've been having sea level rise for many thousands of years. Many generations of humans have survived with it. Sea level continues to rise. What's the big deal? Why, <laughs> why are we so concerned about sea level rise in this generation when we have more technical capability of dealing with it than in the past? So if sea levels have risen and, falled, and fallen uh, over a millennia, why are we so concerned now? Yeah, it's a great question. And one of the pieces of optimism from this work is indeed the seas rose and it, it caused great dislocation and suffering, I think. But on the other hand, our ancestors survived. Enough of them did, right? They told the story and here we are. Um, now, seas did stop rising about 6,000 years ago. They were stable. They started to go down a little bit. And now they've done a sharp turn and are starting to climb up uh, rather rapidly. Um, and the reason for concern is really our specific analysis of this situation. We've got a lot more permanent infrastructure in the way of rising sea levels than our ancestors did. We have a much more crowded and interconnected world where I think displacement and migration would cause much more conflict uh, and, and uh, challenges than they would have that long ago. So part of the lesson to me here is, wow, if this change was so powerful to our ancestors, right, when there were a million people on the whole planet, <laughs> What's it going to do when we have megacities perched right on the delta by the water today all around the world, right? So I think it's a pretty big difference there. Mr. Strauss. So have the seas ever been higher than they are now? That is, we've shown a story lands that have been submerged. Are there lands, are there any lands now inhabited that at one point actually were underwater. So are there lands now that are above sea level that were below sea level in the past? Yes. <laughs> uh, for, the, for the last two million years, uh, we've been going through cycles of ice ages and warm interludes. The warm interludes are generally a great deal briefer. And during the warm interludes, sea level goes up. And in some of them, it, it went higher than we have today. In fact, 100,000 years ago to 120,000 years ago, seas made it like a few meters higher. That's part of how we get the models which let us um, project how much sea will, how much the ocean will rise from different amounts of warming today in the long run, because we have all these data points in the past of the relationship between kind of the warmest part of the warm interlude and how high uh, global sea levels got at that time. So I'm gonna take in, uh, a question from the uh, online community. Um, in terms of climate change, what are the top three things that average citizens can do? You, you talked about individual action being important, but communal action being critical, yeah. but on the individual action, yeah. what are three things that people yeah. can do that will actually have a significant impact? Yeah, so I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll actually say, uh, to me, the number one thing is to talk, and through that talking, influence your circles, right? So not just changing yourself, but changing your what your family does, what your school does, what your business does, your community, your country, right? So uh, to me, really, talk is the biggest force multiplier. Now, when you do that, of course, it helps when you talk about a challenge to be um, conducting yourself in a way that's consistent with you know, the, the path that you want the larger group to set. And so my philosophy of kind of personal choices, and this is just personal, is, you know, we can't be purists or Puritans 
um, or, or, or perfect. So I like to really think about what has the biggest impact. You know, recycling has almost no impact on climate change. That's a great thing to do. But for climate change, I would look at the really big decisions, like your, your car, your appliances, how much you fly. Um, and if you need to fly a lot, really invest in high quality offsets. Um, I, I will say that if I look at my own life, I do great on almost all the measures. Easiest one that you can do tomorrow is change your diet to vegetarian or near vegetarian, uh, reduce your climate impact, get healthy, spend less money. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, flying is the one that really gets me. And so we, we invest in, in offsets, but ones that we look at very carefully to make sure that they're real. Um, one or two more questions, one there, and then one here and one there, and we'll keep them brief and we'll try and get through them. Do you view the, the population growth as an underlying impetus toward the uh, uh, great floods we uh, can anticipate? And if you so, is there anything we can do beyond uh, what you indicated to uh, convince people to uh, take the uh, uh, family planning and birth control uh, seriously. Yeah. So, how much is the population growth versus consumption the issue in in climate change? Yeah, I, I both population growth and consumption are issues, but consumption is the larger issue. Like impact is the product of population times consumption per capita, and it's consumption per capita that's really driving it. Scientific community is absurd, and we believe it uh, because those are experts. That this, this climate change that we're experiencing now is owing to human action, whereas the others were in the civil order of things. Is there a difference between the two? Yeah. So, I, and that's something, right? Around. Can you repeat the question. The, the question is how can we tell the difference between um, past natural climate changes? with the current climate change? How do we know this one is caused by us? And uh, uh, this is a point that has been used by uh, some individuals and groups that want to delay action or confuse people. Um, how do we know that you know, climate has always changed and it's just changing again? This should be natural. Um, to which you might say, there have always been natural forest fires, but that doesn't make it impossible to start a forest fire at a campsite, right? Or by taking a blowtorch into a dry forest. That's it's not okay. And um, you can actually diagnose the difference between events like that. In the case of the forest fire, did the fire start during a lightning storm in a remote wilderness area? Or did it start on a nice clear day right by a campsite uh, or next to an electric wire that a tree fell on, right? You can do an investigation. And climate science, modern climate science, is that investigation. And we have like a room full of scientific papers this big that say human fingerprints are all over it. So is there a manifest difference? Oh, in the a way manifest change? difference. Um, I would say the biggest difference is the speed of this change, that we, we are changing the atmosphere and the world temperature faster than it's changed in at least 50 million years. And it's, it's speed that makes a bullet dangerous, right? So there was one last question. Yep. So you mentioned that the problem is the problem is that it's happening in the next 100 years, 200 years. Now, I said, so rather than I use the two of you, it's called a million years, so this is something to worry about. But if you look at geological history, you also mentioned during your speech there are there are moments in geological history where there were very significant floods and they were very, very short period of time. And we get back on some people talk about the next human innovation, suddenly the flooding over a period of time. And I guess it's gone two or three months. That was an enormous amount of work and a lot of people in this. And then you hear about things like the Antarctic Ice Sheet, and the Antarctic Ice Sheet, which sort of suddenly collapsed with the Greenland uh, glaciers, suddenly collapsed 
So I'm going to summarize it by saying most people think and talk about things happening over a long time frame, but is there something to, that could be catastrophic in a time frame that we would recognize? Yeah. Yeah. So I went into sea level research because it's very visual and simple to explain. But to me, the fast, short term, scariest stuff is really more around drought and food security. Because when you're in year five of a drought, you don't know if it's a five year long drought or a 50 year long drought. And the record tells us that there have been mega droughts like that. And that we're, and we now understand ourselves to be very much increasing the odds. Uh, and when you, when you start to have major crop failures and generate food insecurity, right, there's a direct line to political instability and conflict. So I think, you know, that, that to me is the thing that's already acting quickly in some regions of the world. Um, and also we look at extreme weather, right? People experience hurricanes that are um, intensifying much more rapidly than they used to. There's clear climate fingerprints in many of those. There are heat waves with fingerprints, right? There, there are a lot of events that are in the news that we're experiencing. And this is a whole other area of work that we do where we can actually put a specific quantified scientific fingerprint. This impact today, not tomorrow, right, was brought to you by climate change. So I agree, like there's a, there's a great need to bring things into the present tense as a major part of the discussion. Ben, thank you so much for your narrative and storytelling. Uh, I think the translational work that you do is critically important, and we are so grateful that you could bring it to us, and I can't wait to read the book. So thank you for coming. Thank you so much.